Dad, we said no phones at the dinner table. I know, just replying. Cliff got a new set of clubs, just telling him mine are better. Adding a dog filter to his face and set. Okay, you can text your friends later. Mom, you too. Hang on, just making a meme for a group chat about Bridge. Glenda's gonna flip out. You know, the whole family comes to Florida to visit you guys, and all you do is sit on your phones. Look, I know you're very happy about your new deal from AT&T. Two lines, 40 bucks a month each, unlimited for people 55 and over. But it's family time. You know the rules. Yes, top score. Take that, Jeanette. Mom. Fine. I was done anyway. Floridians 55 and over get two lines with unlimited talk, text, and data for $40 a month per line with AT&T. Visit your nearest AT&T store today. Curbside service available in most locations. Learn more at att.com slash 55 plus. AT&T may temporarily slow data speeds if the network is basic available in store to Florida residents 55 plus only. Requires AT&T unlimited 55 plus plan. Additional usage, speed, limits, and other restrictions apply. Price shown is after all discounts, which starts within two bills. Taxes and fees extra. Dad, we said no phones at the dinner table. I know, just replying. Cliff got a new set of clubs, just telling him mine are better. Adding a dog filter to his face and set okay you can text your friends later mom you too hang on just making a meme for a group chat about bridge glenda's gonna flip out you know the whole family comes to florida to visit you guys and all you do is sit on your phones look i know you're very happy about your new deal from at&t two lines 40 bucks a month each unlimited for people 55 and over but it's family time you know the rules yes top score take that jeanette Mom. Fine. I was done anyway. Floridians 55 and over get two lines with unlimited talk, text, and data for $40 a month per line with AT&T. Visit your nearest AT&T store today. Curbside service available in most locations. Learn more at att.com slash 55 plus. AT&T may temporarily slow data speeds if the network is basic available in store to Florida residents 55 plus only. Requires AT&T unlimited 55 plus plan. Additional usage, speed, limits, and other restrictions apply. Price shown is after all discounts, which starts within two bills. Taxes and fees extra. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by CartKing.com. That's Cart-King.com. Their number is 877-986-7771. Give them a call, tell them Ed Opperman, so that you get a good deal. Uh, have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Uh, perhaps your current business wants to add multiple point-of-sale locations across the country quickly. Maybe the facility you manage could kickstart revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. If you got a warehouse or a hospital building, doctor's office, you got a space there in the lobby, put a little coffee cart down there. CartKing.com can be the answer to your needs. CartKing.com is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile retail coffee and food carts and kiosks that money can buy. For 20 years, CartKing.com has been working with clients and corporations across America uh, to provide indoor and outdoor carts and kiosks for any applications, those big heated ones outdoors where they sell uh, hot dogs at the Little League stand or uh, fireworks or shaved ice those uh, in the summertime or, or the ones you see at the mall in the airport selling kiosks, uh, selling a coffee and a flowers, flower cart, all that kind of stuff. CartKing.com, that's cart-king.com. Give them a call, 877-986-7771. Okay, uh, really excited about today's show. Okay, we got all this stuff in the news about the good old Brett Kavanaugh, the 24-hour news station, Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, but we have an insider, Patrick Knowlton, you might recall him. He's been on our show before. I encourage you to go back to the archives and find that show. Patrick Knowlton was a witness in the Vince Foster death. He was there at the park. He was, he was an eyewitness, not to the actual murder, but he saw the car there. Uh, contacted the, the authorities right away. He had notes. Uh, anyway, Patrick Knowlton is going to tell us about his experience with Brett Kavanaugh. So, oh, by the way, too, he just wrote another book, too, uh, called uh, As If It Never Happened. And it's going to be in the Opera Report bookstore. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, his website is FBICoverup.com. That's FBICover-up.com. And you can meet him in person. Uh, be friendly when you meet him. <laughs> okay. You know, maybe I shouldn't be giving your whereabouts out, you know, but you meet him in person, sir. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Syracuse, New York, uh, Palm Springs, and Tampa, Florida. He's going to be doing book signings, okay? You know, I just had some trouble getting him on the phone. I was worried. I said, maybe they got to him. Patrick Knowlton, are you there? I'm here. Nice to hear you, Ed. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you so much for getting a hold of me. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, well, the, I guess the, the best place to start is um, how I met Brett Kavanaugh. And, um, and to give you a little background on to... Uh, how this all came about. And well, yeah, before we get I to that, a lot of time with the guy. Wait, wait, why don't you yeah. remind the audience about who, who is um, uh, uh, Patrick Knowlton? Tell us about your life and what you're doing. I yes. know you're down in Mexico. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, right now I'm on vacation. So, yeah. so uh, you caught me at a good time. But um, yes, yeah, so um, just a little background information. I, uh, I, I Currently, I work as a, a healthcare consultant, so I'm doing healthcare work, um, trying to hold some of these hospitals together. That are that are bleeding out because of lack of money and all that kind of stuff going on. So I spend a lot of time working with uh, with medical staff and leaders. Um, how I got involved in uh, the Vince Foster case, uh, I was heading back home uh, to a house in Virginia when um, I pulled into Fort Marcy Park where Vince Foster's body was found at six o'clock in the evening. I got there at four thirty about the time of death. I would want to relieve myself. Uh, there was a guy in the park who had his car back then. There was only two cars in the parking lot, a brown uh, Honda with Arkansas license plates, an older car, and then um, this other newer uh, kind of bluish-gray car uh, back then. The guy sitting in it looked Hispanic, Middle Eastern. I couldn't really tell. Um, I I did my thing, and I got back in the car and left, and um Next day, I heard that Vince Foster was found dead in the park, and they believed his body. He, they believed he died around 4:30. I was like, "Wow, I was there at 4:30. You got to be kidding!" So, I called my wife. Now she's my girlfriend. Then she was working on her PhD, and I said, "You know, I was at the park where they found this guy's body. What should I do?" She says, "We'll take notes. Write notes. Write everything you remember. Write everything down." So I did. I wrote everything I remember about the guy and the cars, and um, look what I saw inside the cars. So, anyway, I reported that to the police. And uh, the park police, that's who was investigating the, the death of Vince Foster. Um, and then I went and uh, went about my life, and I told everybody I knew. I said, I can't imagine. I was at that park urinating, and there's a Vince Foster, the president's best friend, which isn't true, but they would say his best friends. But uh, his, his body was in the park, and I was there. Can you imagine that? And so I told lots of people. And then um, I kind of went off and did my did my thing, but it was re rebuilding a house down in Virginia. and. I got a phone call from a reporter uh, about 18 months after the after this whole thing blew over. Well, let me take a step back. So I did. I was interviewed by Robert Fisk's um, Office of Independent Counsel. He was actually called a special prosecutor. He wasn't actually an independent counsel. He was a special prosecutor looking into the death of Foster. So I met with uh, Larry Monroe, Bill Collin, who was the FBI agents working on that case, and I was. Um, in their office twice, um, interviewed about the cars that I saw and things that were I observed in the park, and gave them all the information they possibly could. And uh, then they wrote the Fisk report, and the Fisk report, of course, said I couldn't identify the man I saw in the park, which I said I could. Um, I had nothing really to add to the investigation, which I know I did, because the car that was in the park did not belong to Vince Foster, even though it had Arkansas license plates. Um, and they just kind of falsified my whole test. So now uh, the reporter, Great Evans, gives me a call at my house in Virginia, and uh, she said, I talked to you. And I said, about what? He said, the death of Vincent Foster. Now, like I said, a year and a half had passed, and I'm like, it was a suicide. You know, what more can I, what more can I say? He said, can I get some information? I have your interviews with the FBI. Would you like to see them? So I said, sure. So this was in 1994. I was interviewed by the FBI and the Robert Fisk people. So um, I go to his office. I meet him. I, go to his, I wanted to meet him in an office public place. I had no idea what his game was. And he starts showing me the reports. And I see that they're falsified. And I'm saying to myself, this is a lie. I didn't say this. This is not true. I didn't, you know. So he's taking all these notes. Actually, I think he was tape recording me. But anyway, in Washington, D.C., you can do that. Um, he writes an article for the Sunday, a Sunday London Telegraph. London Sunday Telegraph, excuse me, um, and says to me, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna run a story about you. You heard me called the Ken Star. Now Ken Star's now taking over the investigation of Whitewater, um, and he said uh, I'm gonna write an article that you've never been called to the grand jury, 
to uh, to give you a testimony about what you saw at the park. So he writes this article and it comes out on Sunday. It arrives in America on Tuesday, and we, my girlfriend and I, walk down to the paper stand to, to get it, the newspaper and see what article he wrote. So before he left, so this is an interesting part, a little twist to the story. He, um, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, calls me on the phone on, on Sunday. He's on his way back to London. He says, I hope I haven't uh, put your life in danger by what I'm, what I'm printing in the, in the London Sunday Telegraph. And I said, what are you talking about? He says, your life may be in danger. I'm like, what? I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought I said to my girlfriend, I said, this guy's kind of wacky, you know? Hmm. So anyway, um, that uh, Tuesday afternoon, I um, get the paper, and it's a full-page uh, spread in, the, in, the, in this telegraph, this huge newspaper that circulated around the world. My picture with Hillary Clinton is in the column, and Vince Foster and Bill, and oh, it's just, it was shocking to see my name in big bold letters with all these other people. I couldn't make sense, but then I read the article. And um, I was taken aback by it, so we go back home, and um, the next afternoon I get a phone call, and it's uh, FBI agent who's working for Ken Starr, and he says, uh, Mr. Nolte, my name is Agent Bradsford. Russell Bransford, I'm going to come over to your home here and deliver a subpoena for you. I said, a subpoena for what? He goes, I'm for, for the Whitewater Grand Jury and the death of Vincent Foster. And I'm like, wait a minute, nobody's even talked to me. I, I haven't been interviewed by you you guys. I mean, you were here pulling me before the grand jury to do what? I mean, usually you interview people, then you go before the grand jury. Um, usually that's the way I hear it's done anyway. So uh, he comes over, delivers me a subpoena. Uh, yeah. The next half hour after he leaves, my girlfriend and I go out to take a walk, and right at that moment, I started getting harassed. People start following us around on the street, people glaring at me as they walk towards me, these really kind of stern kind of faces, big guys, guys, they're obviously military or FBI stringers or something, just, you know, muscle guys with crew cuts, and my girlfriend at the time was saying to me, look at, look at these guys, look at you, you know? And um, she wasn't somebody who would really pay attention to that kind of stuff either. So anyway, so um, this happens, this goes on, this harassment went on for the whole evening. Anywhere I went, everywhere I went, they came to my house, they knocked on my doors, they were outside the front of my building, just guys on goons hanging around. Um, and the next day I was supposed to appear before the grand jury. So what I go to appear before the grand jury, I get to meet Mr. Brett Kavanaugh. And Brett Kavanaugh is there, and I had no introduction to him whatsoever. Um, he and John Bates, and John Bates is another uh, federal judge now, um, working on. He was actually the special judge. I can't think of what the title they gave him now, but he was the secret court judge for a while, um, allowing people to. He was the okaying all the uh, surveillance of American citizens. He was okaying all that kind of stuff, um, giving subpoena or giving a. Uh, um, um, the FBI and uh, any any law enforcement agency, CIA, whoever it may be, the right to phone taps and things like that. Anyway, so uh, I get into the grand jury, and Brett Kavanaugh, um, young guy, I guess he was 29. I was in my, I was just like 35 myself, um, 40 maybe, and uh, he was a young guy. And the guy John Bates sat behind me, and they started asking me questions, and I start, you know, off right away saying I want to know who. Um, who are these people following me around? Who, who's her, why am I being harassed? I mean, mm -hmm. what am I being harassed for? Who's harassing me? So I'm asking them all these questions. They get very irritated. They say to me, you know, you're not here to ask those questions. We're here to ask you questions. So the gallery had about 27, I think it was 27 people that were the, the, the grand jurors, 22, 27, stuff like that. And um, he starts asking me questions, you know, to, uh, allegedly, tell me about this alleged stuff. Tell me about what you saw in the park. Tell me about the car you saw. Tell me about... So I saw about the brown car. I saw the older car. I saw the contents, the briefcase, and the suit jacket in that car. I tell them about the guy in the other in the other car. I think very suspicious. So they really just trying to. They asked me if I had media coverage. Was I writing a book? Was I get paid for the story? They were just trying to smear me a little bit here and there. So they asked me to step out of the room so the jurors could ask. Um, question. And I thought, well, the jurors are going to ask questions. Why, why can't I stay in the room? But I go out, leave the room. Um, about 10 minutes later, they call me back in. And I sit down back in the uh, in the seat. 
and the uh, Brett Kavanaugh um, gets a note.